Hello, it's Pietro Zucco here from Messi Circuits. In today's video, we will learn step by step everything you need to know to master how to use a soldering iron. Before we start, some disclaimer, soldering could be dangerous. If you are not cautious, you might injure yourself or start a fire. So be very careful here, use common sense. I'm not responsible for any damage you might cause after watching this video. Most of the stuff you will see here is listed below in the description. I put links from Amazon. So if you purchase any of this stuff through the links, you will support this channel, in which case I thank you in advance. If you want to start in electronics, even at a very low level building prototypes and kits, sooner or later you will have to use a solder in iron. It might look challenging or scary at the beginning, especially if you never used one before, but if you follow proper precautions, it's not really such a big deal. Let's get into it. What do you need to start soldering? Basically, first of all, you need a soldering iron. One like this one is cheap and does the job. I started with something like this. At least make sure that you can replace the tip, that you can change it by a new one, because it will get old very soon if you start using them a lot. Then you need a stand holder, because when you're soldering, after you finish, you need to put your soldering iron somewhere like this. Then you will need solder, you will need flux and finally you need to work on a surface that you are sure you're not going to ruin. You don't want to destroy your expensive Coco Bolo desk by burning with the tip of the soldering iron. I strongly advise to get something like what I have here. This blue mat here is made of silicon and it doesn't melt if the soldering iron tip goes on top of it. Also, they're very handy because they allow you to put different parts in these compartments and some of them have magnets which allow you to stick the screws or other stuff like that. If you can spend a little bit more money, I would suggest to get a soldering station like this one or similar. Here you can control the temperature, which in that case should be between 300 and 325 degrees Celsius or 470 and 620 Fahrenheit. When holding the soldering iron, make sure you do it in a way similar to this one. Never ever touch the metal part because it's extremely hot and you're going to burn yourself. And when soldering, use it like if it was a pencil, so you can easily control the time you have the tip on top of the material. Now let's talk about the different kinds of solder you can use. I'm not an English native speaker and I believe in the US is pronounced solder and here in the UK is solder. Anyway, you know what I mean. Solder is composed by an alloy of different metals. Some contain lead, which can be a bit toxic, but melts faster. Usually I like to use a 60% and 40% means 60% of tin and 40% of lead. Some solder are, is called rosin core. It means that here inside the solder itself, there is flux and flux is this material here which helps to keep the surfaces clean and remove oxidation there are different kind of fluxes as well i like having this one that is some sort of like a paste in a jar but you can buy different ones if you get dirty with the flux like it happens in my case here you can just easily remove it with alcohol by alcohol i mean something like this one rubbing alcohol not the drinking ones you also have to take into consideration the diameter of the solder. This one is 0.8 millimeters. This one, for example, is one millimeter. It's important because when you're using the soldering iron, you don't want to feed too much of solder in the particular situation. So you can control the amount that you are using. Before you start, I recommend you to use these prototype boards. They are perforated. So on one side, they are completely insulated. On the other side, as you can see, every hole has a little bit, a little ring of copper which make it conductive so you can solder it on that side. These are really cheap. You can go even fancier with something like this one. But for now, for learning, I really suggest to use something like this one so you can practice. First of all, we are going to use which is called some through hole components, like for example, this LED here. They all have something in common that they have these long legs which is they just go through these holes on one side and on the other side you can put the solder here so they will get fixed and make contact. First, we need to bend the resistor legs at an approximate distance to fit the holes in the board.
Once it's inside, bend the legs on the other side to keep it in place. Something I really like to use, which is not totally necessary, is a helping hand. Something like this, for example, you can just your board here, push a little bit and then lock it here. Allows you to rotate in the position that you want and then it's easy to remove by just pushing this spring. Also, you can get something like this one, which is the octopus. You can get the piece that you need to solder there and keep it in place. When this is in place, position the soldering iron tip on the component leg and then gently push the solder like here. Then you can cut the legs of the component. One trick to bend this that I use if you have tweezers like these ones you see that the surface here is a little bit different. On the tip is smaller and as you move up it becomes wider. Well, if you look at the distance basically that you need here, it's very very close to the point of maybe less than one millimeter I guess. So for example if you put this in this position and then apply force with the tweezers and then with the finger you bend it here, you get it right in that. So if I do the same on the other side press strongly with this and then bend it then I get I get it into the right distance I'm gonna show you here a very common mistake that you don't want to make so if you put too much of it you might bridge one component to the other for example let's say I go crazy now here look at that you're bridging them that is something you definitely don't want to do so you have to apply just gently enough pressure and, and feed enough to just have a nice like that a nice little bump in there not too much not too little if you put too little like in this case for example if i do just like this well in that area it might still do the contact but as soon as you move it or there is a little bit of stress and mechanical stress it might just disconnect another common mistake is to put some solder on the tip and then apply it on the electronic component like this and then when you create a little like drop in there then try to apply it there although it looks like it might work the problem with that is that it might oxidate the tin on the tip by the time you do this and then when you try to apply it you see it doesn't stick properly you see when it creates that sort of hat in there look at that you look at this look at this effect that is happening here this is oxidation you see that it's not fluid anymore it becomes like this kind of melt glue that's because it's oxidated way too long and also by doing that way you cannot control the amount of solder that you need to put on the component so this is something you really don't want because also you're going to end up bridging look at that it doesn't even connect properly to the next side well, when this happens, you might end up even having something which is worse, which is called a cold joint. And a cold joint is that it looks like you have soldered the, the, the component, but actually you didn't. And the problem is that you have something that doesn't have a connection, or even worse, it has an intermittent connection. Another type of through-hole component is when you want to attach the header pins to a board, like this Arduino Nano, that comes separated like this, and it has the header pins. You need this, for example, if you want to attach it to another board or if you want to use it on a breadboard like this one. So an easy trick to do this is just place the header pins first and then attach it to the breadboard. I like to go here on the side like this and then gently keep pushing a little bit of the solder until you create a nice surface there. Soldering all of them. Once you're done, if you need to remove this, uh, be careful. I used a nylon spudger. This is also doesn't create static, so you don't take the risk of maybe transferring any electricity into it. So gently put it down from one side, 
gently on the other and then you take it out. Now let's talk about soldering wires. Most common wires will be of two types, stranded core wire which is made of a bunch of tiny individual strands of metal and solid coat wire which is made of one single core of metal. I prefer the stranded one which is better for individual projects and prototypes. They are flexible and easier to handle. On both types of wire we need to thin the wires. It means applying a very thin layer of solder on the surface. The purpose of this is to make it the process of melting the solder from the wire to the board faster and cleaner. On the stranded wire we first strip off about 3 mm and then twist the strands very tight and nice like this. Finally we apply a little bit of solder, it will weaken absorbing it by capillary action. Don't put too much, just feed enough solder to get the nice layer just to coat the strands. As you can see, this became like a solid structure, like a solid piece of wire. By doing this, it's easier for us to use it as a through hole component, so we can have the wire going through the hole and then we can apply more solder on it. For the single core metal wire, we don't have the advantage of the strand weakening the solder, so we need to make sure that the whole area is thinned. Some wires, like this one, already come thin, so I just did it, did it for demonstration purposes. Some others are just, you can see that they bear copper on it and you need to actually thin on them. The wire insulation can be a silicon or other material. You have to be careful here because silicon is not going to melt when the heat is applied, but other materials most likely will. So if you plan to have, let's say, it's 3 mm exposed wire and then it melts part of the insulation, you end up with a longer exposed wire. For example, this one here, you can see that the plastic is melting, you see? So you have to be careful with this. Also, you don't want to have melted plastic on the tip of your solder. It's going to get it dirty. This one, for example, is made of silicone. As you can see, it's not affected by the heat of the solder. It doesn't melt. A common mistake with a stranded wire is that if you forget to twist it or you don't twist it properly, you end up with a very variable thickness of the in the tip. For example, let's do it in this case. This is wrong. So this is not a good result. First of all, we didn't twist it. So as you can see, it's, th it's quite thick. Then we left a little bump of solder on it, which is bad too. If we want to pass this through a circuit, like in this case, it doesn't fit in the hole. Let's see now how to splice two pieces of wire together. Strip about five millimeters on both sides of the wire. Then twist the strands of each wire together. In this way you create some mechanical resistance when the wires are being pulled in each direction. As before, thin the surface and let the solder to wick in. If it's too long, just cut a little bit and let one side to bend on the other, like this. Now you need to insulate this. There are two ways you can do this. One. You can use electrical tape, but I strongly advise not to do that because with time it loses tightness and the glue also liquefies, meaning that also your insulation will be off at some point, and that could be very dangerous. Instead, use a shrink tube, which is basically a material that shrinks with heat. You can buy something in this format, links below. So what you basically do is you put the tube around the insulation and then when you heat it up it will shrink. Now to heat it up you can just use a normal lighter but personally I prefer to use my heat gun. As you can see it shrinked and covered all the exposed wire in a very nice and clean way. Now for example I'm going to show you shrinking with the lighter. The reason I don't like to do with the lighter is this. As you can see, it shrinked, it did the job, but it le left all that carbon, all that dirt on top of it. How to attach a wire to a board that doesn't have pinholes, like in this case. For the wires, follow the same process as before to thin the tip. 
on the board, feed a small amount of solder onto the pad until you get a nice smooth bump that sticks up a little bit. Then heat up the blob and gently insert the wire. These are the most common scenarios you will find when soldering, so now let's learn some soldering iron tip maintenance. Most holder stands have a little sponge that you can soak in water, but be careful not to put too much, just enough to get it wet. That will help to clean the tip. Another way is to use a wire tap tip cleaner. These are very cheap and provide a very good cleaning for the tip. Finally, some safety measures. Make sure the room is ventilated because as you keep soldering, gases accumulate and it's not healthy to breathe that, especially the flux which evaporates very quickly. You can use a fumes extractor. There are many different kinds. I never had the need to use one because I happened to have a window next to me. But anyway, it doesn't hurt if you had the budget and the space for one. Also, I would recommend to use some safety goggles and a mask if you find the fumes too irritating, but no need to overdo. If you made it this far, I hope this video will help you in your electronic journey. Remember to subscribe and as always, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.